Hello, in this presentation, we will be recording transactions related to cash. We're going to take this data down here, listing the activity that is happening. All activity, all A through F, will involve financial transactions that deal with cash in one way or the other. We will journalize those transactions here. It's good to get used to the terminology as we start to work with journal entry. We're going to start learning the debits and credits, of course. Also, we need to know what a journal entry is. We typically call this the general journal, just this piece of paper, basically, this Excel sheet. That's where we are going to put the journal entry. The process of recording the journal entry is called journalizing the journal entry. And then we are going to post the journal entry to this worksheet. Now, this is not the general ledger. We will be recording the general ledger at a later problem. This problem is a worksheet designed to give us a quick idea of the activity that will happen and the effect on the accounts and the accounting equation through this quick worksheet. We will then work similar problems at a later time and post to the general ledger and then create the trial balance as is often a typical problem for uh, accounting and you know, learning the debits and credits. But this worksheet, when there's relatively few debits and credits, really helpful to understand what is happening to particular accounts. So we're gonna take this information, we are gonna record the journal entry here, post them to this blue area in the center column. What that will do is it'll take this beginning balance and it will then uh, take the, the entries and provide us with the ending balance. This over here is called a trial balance. So we have a trial balance and that's gonna list the chart of accounts. So we've got assets in green, uh, liabilities in orange, we have the equity in the light blue, and then the revenue accounts, revenue and expenses in dark blue. Remember that a trial balance will not typically be colored in this way, but it will always remain in balance in the, I mean, it'll always be in this order, meaning all trial balances and all chart of accounts typically will be in the order of assets, then liabilities, then equity, then revenue, then expenses. That's a great thing to have because it really gives you an idea of where accounts fall. Meaning, if we don't know where a particular account is, whether it's an asset, liability, equity, income, or expense account, a trial balance will give us that idea, will give us that information. For example, if I just had unearned revenue over here, someone gave us the account unearned revenue, and I didn't know whether that was an asset, liability, owner's equity, income, or expense account. However, I had a list of accounts, chart of accounts, or trial balance. I could then find that unearned revenue and say, hmm, it's next to the other payable, uh, payable here, meaning it looks like a liability account just by where it's grouped. Now, we don't have any, any amounts in the trial balance here yet, but as we do get amounts in the trial balance, the trial balance will also be a great uh, way for us to know what the normal balances of an account are. So given that, let's start to record this information. Also note before we record this information that we're going to have the accounting equation will be calculated up top for the total at the end of our process. And we're also going to record the effect on the accounting equation over here with regard to each individual transaction. So let's scroll down. First activity A says owner A deposits cash into the business checking account 130,000. Now we're going to go through our thought process of asking first is cash affected? Of course, cash will be affected for all of these journal entries because we're focusing in on cash. But we want to get in the practice of learning this thought process. Again, the thought process will get us moving. It'll give us started in a direction. And it'll also prevent us from making common errors and learning rules that don't always apply. It'll also prep us for working more complex journal entries at a later time. So first question we're going to ask, is cash affected? And of course it is. In this case, the cash is going up for the business, going down for the owner, but up for the business. Then we're going to ask, well, cash has a normal debit balance as an asset, and therefore we need to make it go up. In order to make something go up, we do the same thing to it as its normal balance, which in this case is another debit. So I'm going to copy this cash. I could just type it over here, but I'm going to copy it. And rather than pasting it just normal like this, which would change the color of the cell, I really just want to see the value. 
So I'm going to paste the values only like this. And, and again, we could just type it in there, but uh, that's uh, I'm going to get used to get the practice in on copying and pasting. And then I'm going to type in what we know. I know it's going to be 130,000 debit. Now I'm going to represent the credits. I know I'm going to have a credit of some kind of 130,000. I'm going to go ahead and type that in there and put the information down as we know it. I'm going to represent credits with a negative number. This could start to be confusing at first. I'm going to put in a negative 130,000, no commas, no brackets. Then when we select enter, we'll put the brackets and the comma there due to the formatting in Excel. Note that many texts will not actually put the, the credits with brackets, but in practice, this will often happen within different softwares and within Excel. Uh, the reason I'm going to start using brackets is because functionally it's really useful to do. And when you get into practice, there's often situations where it's going to be very useful to do. It will also really help to simplify our worksheet over here. And so I hope to convince you that uh, it's worth learning the brackets here. No matter what we do, we're going to have this problem of trying to differentiate what is a debit and credit and what are the operations of adding and subtraction. And we have to differentiate that even when and while we are using adding and subtraction in order to uh, move the numbers around in the format of debits and credits. So there's no way to get around having to understand that and putting the credits without brackets is, is, isn't going to solve the problem in, in, in that. And therefore, uh, we're going we're gonna to use the brackets and that'll also simplify our worksheet. So we'll show that in time. So what's the other account is all we need now in order to complete this first journal entry. Who put the money in to the business? The owner did. And therefore, we're looking for an owner's equity account. Those are going to be the light blue accounts. It's in order, assets, liability, equity. So here's the equity account. Now, all I need to do is copy that. I'm going to right click and copy this. I'm going to put that in cell B6, right click and paste it. Once again, not the formatting, just the values. And again, we could type it in there, but I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste it to practice the copying and pasting. Note that we already know it's going to be credited due to the debiting of cash. And that's the reason for always thinking about cash first, or at least one of the reasons. And so we already know we're going to credit this owner equity, owner capital, which is an equity account. Now we want to think through though, is that case, uh, why is that the case? And double check our work by answering why that is the case. So we know that the capital account here has a normal credit balance. If we were to look at a, at a cheat sheet, we'd see normal credit balance for capital accounts. And it should be increasing due to the fact that uh, the owner put more money in and then therefore is owed more money. The way to increase something is to do the same thing to it, which in this case would be another credit. So we're going to credit the account, which will increase it. That does make sense. Looks correct. Just for formatting, I'm also going to indent the second account. And the way to do that in Excel, or one way to do it at least, is to go to the Home tab, go to the Alignment group, and then use this Increase Indent item here. Okay, so Increase Indent. I think it's locking the cell to not do that. Hold on. So that, that function's not working with a protected worksheet, and I'm going to try to protect the worksheet in order for you to, to not actually delete some, some cells that uh, you don't want to delete. And therefore, I'm going to go ahead and double click and indent with the space. So I'm going to do the spaces like that. Uh, double click on it and space three times. Uh, when in, a, in a new Excel worksheet, you could then use this indent function, and uh, that is the way I would suggest doing it most of the time. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and post this. So this is the process of posting. However, we're not posting to the general ledger, but just posting to a worksheet for now. So this is the first cash account. It's going to be the first account on the trial balance. I'm going to go here in cell G5 and say equals. And I'm always going to use formulas here because I, the formulas will help us to tie out what is happening. So I'm going to say equals and then I'm going to point to this 130,000 and enter. And that will increase our cash in the debit direction by 130 to 130, put us out of balance by 130, meaning we have a debit with no related credit, therefore out of balance here and out of balance in the ending balance here. We're then going to post the other side, owner capital. Here's owner capital. So we're going to go into our entry column. It starts at zero, of course. We are in cell G10. 
10 and I'm going to select equal to, to point to this cell and I'm going to pull it over with a formula. When we select enter, then we're going to see that credit represented by a negative number. 130 here, put us back in balance here and uh, that's what we'll have here. So we have the 130,000 increasing in the credit direction. Now it's important to note that we're representing debits and credits here with a positive number or a non-bracketed number and a negative number or a bracketed number not having two columns. By doing so, we can use a formula that will then say, give me the total debits minus the credits. If they are equal, then debits minus the credits will then equal zero. So we know that the, the debits equal the credits by the fact that the debits minus the credits equal zero. The reason that's really going to be useful here is that it, it really eliminates a lot of more complicated formulas and it gives us some good information, meaning if we were to have two columns for each of these rows, we would have a worksheet with six columns and we would then have to take row one minus row two to verify or check each of these, you know, there'd be six columns, we would have to check to see if, if all six uh, had pairs of two, which were all in balance. So hopefully you see that this is really going to simplify the process. Over here we got debits and credits, debits on the left, credits on the right, and credits represented with bracketed numbers. Over here we're going to just have debits with positive or non-bracketed numbers, credits with bracketed numbers, and show the balancing effect through the debits minus the credits equaling zero. We also see that net income is calculated here. Um, and there's nothing in net income at this point not affected because no revenue or expense accounts have been impacted as of yet. The, then we're going to move over to our accounting equation and we're going to try to see what happened. Now it already gave us this one this time because it's the only transaction so the totals we can see that assets are increasing and equity is increasing but that's the case here. We're going to say that uh, that the cash went up. Cash is an asset. It is increasing. So I'm going to just select a drop down increase liability nothing's happening in the orange accounts no effect and then the equity section it's going up in the credit direction so remember this is a credit doesn't mean it's going negative in the hole it's saying that it's going up in the credit direction so i'm going to say this is a credit and it's increasing next transaction we see b says receive cash from client for work thirteen thousand. So our first question as always is, is cash affected? And of course, in this case it is, all the transactions in this problem will have cash affected. Is cash going up or down? And the keyword here being received, therefore cash is going up. So we're gonna increase cash. We know that cash has a debit balance. We can see that by it being represented without brackets. In order to make any account go up, we do the same thing to it, which in this case would be another debit. So I'm going to copy the cash account and I'm going to put the debit on top. Note that debits always go on top. So I'm going to put the debit on top. That's just a matter of convention. So there's the debit and the amount then being 13,000. So I'm not going to put any commas or anything like that. Just the 13,000. There we have it. I know then that if there are only two accounts affected, which there are, we will then also have a credit of some account of the dollar amount of negative or credit 13,000. Again, I'm representing them with negative numbers or credits for formula purposes. And there we have that. It is a common way to do that. And then we're, we just need to then find out what this account is that we will then be crediting, receive cash from client for work done. So the reason we got money, as will be the typical reason for getting money, is because we did work. Once we know that, the only question is, when did we do the work? Did we do the work in the past and therefore are collecting a receivable? Or did we do the, are we going to do the work in the future? Meaning we got money and haven't yet earned it, unearned revenue. Or have we done the work at the same time? Meaning we did the work and we got paid at the same point in time. That's the case here. So we did work, we got paid at the same point in time. This would be a typical case for like, if, you know, many times if you're thinking about food vendors or something like that. They typically perform the work, provide the food at the same point in time that they receive payment and therefore would be debiting cash and crediting revenue at that point in time as we are doing here. I already know that we're going to credit revenue due to the fact that we debited cash, that being the reason 
that we start with cash. I'm going to copy the revenue or expense, right click and paste it one, two, three values only. I'm going to double click on it now and I'm going to try to indent one, two, three. And again, if, it, if the cell wasn't locked, then I would go ahead in the alignment group in the home tab and increase indent in that format. Now that we know that we're already going to credit revenue, it's good to double check our work and say, well, does it make sense that we're crediting revenue? We only credited it because we debited cash. Does it make sense that that is the correct thing to do? And of course, we know if we look at our cheat sheet, we know that revenue has a normal credit balance. And it's also good to start to memorize that revenue and, and expenses, all income statement accounts, these accounts down here, only go up. Revenue only goes up in the credit direction. So if we know that revenue has a credit balance and we know that it's going up, we know that we're going to have to do the same thing to it as its normal balance, which in this case is a credit. So we kind of double check our work in our mind to, to see that that is true, that that's going to be a credit. Otherwise, we're just basically being dependent on what's happening in cash and we're not fully understanding why we're posting this credit to uh, income or revenue. So that'll get the job done, but it won't give us the full understanding to get the full understanding and provide a double check. You then want to basically go back in here and, and ask yourself those questions. Does it make sense that we are crediting revenue even if we had not known that cash was being debited? Now we're going to go ahead and post this out. So this is the journal entry that we recorded or journalized in this whole sheet being the general journal. We are now posting not to the general ledger, ledger as we will do later, but to a worksheet. And there's first count is going to be cash. Now I'm going to post to the center column, but there's already something in cash. So we're going to post a bunch of different things to cash. I can see what's in cash up here. It's C5. And what I want to do is add to that. The way to do that is I'm going to double click on it. I'm going to go to the end of the C5 and I can see that reference here. I'm going to say plus and then point to this 13. So it's going to be C equals C5 plus C8 and enter. So we basically just took the 130 plus the 13 giving us the 143. Now if anything gets messed up and you just delete this cell, you can do the whole thing again. I'm just going to say equals. I want this cash number. I'm just going to point to it. That number plus this cash number i'm just going to point to it that number and then that'll that'll give us that number so that increased the cash in the debit direction then we're going to record the other side which is revenue here's revenue starts at zero we are going to record it in cell g11 so i'm going to say equals and then point to this credit that's going to take it from zero up in the credit direction to 13,000 credit put us back in balance and it'll make net income go up in the credit direction so there we have that we know that we are in balance both in this column and this column given that the debit of cash minus the credit of capital and revenue is zero and we know that net income now is going up by the 13 or we have net income of 13,000 for this time period that being revenue minus expenses this is a negative number to excel but is a credit to us and that's something we just got to kind of understand. This is representing a credit in terms of debits and credits minus what will be the debits to expenses, providing us with a quick calculation of the net income here. Credits beating the debits, meaning we're talking about net income rather than net loss. We're then going to go over here to our accounting equation. We can see that our accounting equation is in balance up here, meaning the assets equal the liabilities plus the equity. That's for the total. We want to see what happened to the accounting equation this time. We know that cash went up. So cash went up. Cash is an asset. Assets went up. So I'm going to say increase there. Nothing happened to liabilities. No orange accounts have been affected. And we know that the revenue went up. Revenue, remember, is part of equity. So if I take the total equity, which was this 130, it went up by this 13 in the credit direction. Also note that revenue or the equity section will always go up in relation to what happened to net income. Net income went up by 13,000. Equity therefore goes up also by 13,000. So I'm going to say that is going to be an increase and there's the effect on the accounting equation. Next we'll take a look at transaction C paid cash to employees for $780. First question as always is cash affected? 
and of course it is, then as all these accounts will be, they won't be later on when we work another problem, but most of them will still have cash affected. That's why we're going to concentrate on cash first. And the next question, is cash going up or down? In this case, it's going down because we paid. Keyword, of course, being paid. And therefore, we're going to decrease cash. Now, cash has a normal debit balance represented by the fact here that it does not have brackets. How do we make something go down? We do the opposite thing to it as its normal balance. Therefore, the opposite thing of this debit here would then be a credit. We're going to credit cash. Now, note that this is the first time that we started thinking about cash, and the first thing was a credit rather than a debit, and credits typically go on the bottom. So I'm going to copy cash, and I'm going to put it on the bottom. So here's C. I'm going to put it on the bottom here. Right-click and paste it. One, two, three. Now, when people first learn uh, the accounting transactions, this oftentimes seems unusual, meaning I'm starting over here with something that's going to be on the bottom rather than starting with the debit first, negative. 780 credit and uh, because of the convention of debits always going on top people tend to think that they need to work from you know left to right top to bottom as is normal the convention for reading uh, but it would be easier for us to construct a journal entry by constructing what we first know and that's why I recommend focusing in on creating the journal entries using what we know first rather than creating the journal entry just based on convention of putting the debits on top and the credits on the bottom. Also note that when we get to more complex journal entries, this will be a lot more easy for us to, to think about and will oftentimes actually uh, deviate from the convention when we need to in order to construct more complex journal entries. For example, when we sell inventory, we often break a typical, a typical journal entry into two journal entries in, in order to post something that makes more sense to us. So I would think of this convention as something we want to follow as much as possible unless it makes more sense to us to read what we have done to break from convention. One reason this convention is here, I would think of it as something that is needed for like computer code. If I was to write computer code for debiting and crediting, we would need to tell the computer that either debits and credits always go on top. But if we're not writing computer code and we're working in an auditing department or doing some other type of transactions, it makes more sense many times to put the debit and credit in the order that we can best go back and read or someone else can go best go back and read and then understand. So I'm going to therefore put the credit on the bottom. I'm going to I'm going to put three spaces here. We then know that we're going to debit something, so therefore I'm going to put on the top a debit of something. So we have an equal number of debits and credits and then just need to know what other account is affected here. That other account being something to do with employees being paid. So if we look at our chart of accounts, we can see that we have something wages expense. That would make sense. It's an expense. So I know that we are always going to, uh, we are already have debited that account. And now I just need to put the account name. So I'm going to copy this. And I'm going to put it in cell B11, right click and paste 123. We already know, of course, that we are going to debit the expense account because we credited cash, that being the purpose for starting with cash, because it's a lot easier for us to know which direction the cash is going than the direction that the expense will be going. Now that we have posted this, however, we want to double check our work. So we want to think, well, what if I didn't know cash was, was uh, going up? What would happen to the expenses? And that will double check our work. We know that expenses, if we look at the normal balance for expenses, they are debit balance accounts. And we also know that all income statement accounts, it's useful to remember, only go in one direction, meaning revenue only goes up in the credit direction and expenses only go up in the debit direction and net income therefore goes up when revenue goes up and goes down when expenses go up calculated as revenue minus expenses. So that means that if expenses only go up and they have debit balances then we're going to make it go up by doing the same thing to it which is another debit. So by thinking through that thought process we think through the reasoning for debiting the expense other than just debiting it because we credited cash and that gives us a better idea of what expenses are and how they function rather than just doing what we need to do uh, because we credited cash. So here we're going to post that now. So here's the wages expense. I'm going to go down to wages expense here. 
in cell G12, select equals, point to the 780. That will bring the zero up by 780 to 780, put us out of balance by 780, and it'll bring net income down. So here we have that. We have the increase in wages expense out of balance by 780. Net income is going down by the 13 now, which was what it was before, minus the 780. Note that this does not represent a loss. It represents how much the credit balance of revenue is greater than the debit balance of expenses. We will then post the other side to cash. So here's cash. Again, something's in it already. So we can see the formula C5 plus C8. If we double click on this cell, we can see the formula again and we can see the highlighted cells. We want to make sure that this highlighter is on the end here before we do anything new. The new thing we will then do is say plus adding this here and then point to the cell. So we want it to be equals C5 plus C8 plus D12 and enter. That will bring this balance down. And that also put us back in balance. And there's transaction number C. Now we'll go ahead and post this transaction, see the activity to the accounting equation. So we can take a look at assets. We know that assets, we see that cash has gone down and therefore assets will decrease because cash is an asset and it went down. So I'm gonna say cash is going down, assets are going to decrease. No effect on liabilities again, so the orange accounts have no effect. So we're gonna say none. And then the equity section, we said that expenses are going to go up. They only go up in the debit direction. That is gonna bring net income down, also bringing the total equity down. So total equity is gonna go down. We also know that it had to go down or decrease due to the fact that the other side assets decreased and therefore it must then decrease as well. Record transaction D says, received cash for work that will be done in the future. Once again, going through our questions, is cash affected? We're gonna say that it is affected and the keyword is received cash. Therefore, cash is gonna be going up. Cash has a normal debit balance represented by the fact that it does not have any brackets around it. In order to make any account go up, we need to do the same thing to it, which in this case would be another debit. So we're gonna debit cash, I'm gonna right click on cash, copy cash, I'm gonna put that on top in cell B14, right click and paste one, two, three. We will then go into cell C14 and we're gonna put the dollar amount, that of 19,500. 19,500, that's correct. We also know that we're gonna credit something for that same dollar amount, we're needing to have a similar or same, not similar, but the same amount of debits and credits. So there we have that. Now we just need to know what that account will be. So now the question is, why did we get uh, 19,500? And then we know we got it from a client for doing work. The only question is then, did we do the work in the past and therefore our should be reducing the receivable? Did we do the work at the same time and therefore should be recording revenue under the revenue recognition principle at this point in time? Or are we doing the work in the future, as is the case here? We're going to do the work in the future. So we got paid before we did the work. That means that we owe work in the future and can't record the revenue at this point in time because we can only record revenue under the revenue recognition principle, accrual principle, when we have earned it. And therefore, we're going to put this to unearned revenue. It's going to be a liability account. It's going to increase. This is often a more complex concept for many people because not many businesses or many businesses do not use unearned revenue very much meaning for example our last example if we were a food if we we're selling food of some kind typically we will collect the revenue at the same time if we are a if we are a bookkeeper or a lawyer then typically we will actually do the work before we get the money and some a case where we get paid before we do the work would often be something like a subscription, like a magazine subscription, uh, or many online types of subscriptions these days where we buy services and pay for the service upfront for say software. That software has not, that software company has not yet earned the revenue until they provide the software in the future. Until that time, it's gonna be a liability. So I'm gonna copy unearned revenue. 
and we will then put that in cell B15, right clicking and paste 123. We already know that unearned revenue will be credited due to the fact that we debited cash, but now we want to double check that. We want to think through that in our mind and see if that makes sense. What if we didn't debit cash first? What if we didn't know what we're doing to cash? We just want to know what's going to happen to unearned revenue. And once again, we think about the idea of revenue is going to be a liability account. Liability accounts have credit balances and unearned revenue is going up, meaning liabilities are going up due to the fact that we owe something in the future. We do not owe necessarily the cash in the future, as is the case with most liabilities like accounts payable. We owe money in the future. In this case, we owe services in the future. We owe the work that we are going to do in the future. And if we don't do that work in the future, then we would owe the money back. So let's post. So let's uh, go ahead and post this now. I'm going to post the cash first. Cash is up here in G5. Something is in it. Therefore, I can see the formula up here. I'm going to double click on it and make sure to go to the end of the formula and then say plus and point to that cash. And so we see then that the formula will be equal C5 plus C8 plus D12 plus C14. Again, if something goes wrong and you accidentally delete this, one, you want you got the undo button, of course, but then you also can say equals and just point to all the accounts that have cash related. So we're going to say this 130, that'll be C5 plus this 13, that'll be C8 plus, and I'm plusing a negative number. Note this is a negative number, so I'm adding a negative, which will subtract it in Excel. This plus, and then I'm going to say this cell and enter. So there we have that. Then I'm going to post the unearned revenue. Here's the unearned revenue. Here's the account we will post it to. And we are in cell G9 equals pointing to the 19. This is going to go up from zero by 19.5 in the credit direction to 19.5. Notice I'm out of balance here and I made an error up here. I'm going to double click on this. Note that I put the credit here rather than the debit. So you might have caught that. So I'm going to go ahead. This this last transaction, D15, I'm going to delete that. And it should be this 19.5 related to cash, not the credit related to unearned revenue. That shows that we were out of balance by double the 19.5 because I posted two uh, credits here. This should put us back in balance. And there we have that. All right, so there is that. I'm going to go ahead and post the activity to our accounting equation. Cash went up. Cash is an asset, therefore assets went up. We see that unearned revenue is a liability. Unearned revenue here is going to go up. So I'm going to go increase uh, unearned revenue. And there's no effect on any of the blue accounts because the revenue was not yet earned and therefore this is going to remain the same so no effect there next we have e paid cash for utilities once again our first question is cash affected and of course it is in this case did it go up or down we paid cash keyword paid and therefore it's going down we know that cash has a debit balance and therefore to make it go down we're going to do the well cash has a debit balance represented by the fact that it does not have brackets anytime to make something go down we do the opposite thing to it which in this case would be a credit so i'm going to copy cash i'm going to put the credit again on the bottom so i'm going to start with the credit because cash is going to be an easier account to think about and right click and put that on the bottom the credit will be 975 so i'm going to put in cell d18 credit 975 then we know that we're going to debit something for 975 as well we just then need to know what that debit will be we paid for utilities so going back to our accounts we can look for something related to utilities and of course find utilities expense here Utilities expense then is going to be the account that we need. I'm going to copy that. I'm going to put that on top here in B B17. Right click and paste one two three. Note that I can also indent these last two credits. I'm going to go back up here in B15. Double click and hit the space bar three times. 
Again, this is convention. You don't really have to do this, but it does emphasize the fact that we're to have a credit here. Double click on B18 before the C, right click or space bar three times. And there we have that. All right, so there's gonna be our transaction. Now we already, we, we can double check then the debit to the expense here. We know we're gonna debit the expense because we credited cash, but it's always good to double check that. We can see that expenses always have, have normal balances of debits, all expenses do, and that we also know that expenses and all income statement accounts only go up. Therefore, revenue goes up in the credit direction, expenses go up in the debit direction, we, we then are going to increase this utilities expense so we have a, a normal debit balance to increase any account. We do the same thing to it as its normal balance, which would be another debit. So that then is just double checking the fact that we're going to debit this account, understanding why we're debiting a utilities expense for the fact of what utilities expense is rather than just debiting it because we credited cash, providing us with that double check. So now we're going to post this. I'm going to post first the utilities expense. Here's utilities expense here. Here it is on the trial balance. Or here it is on the trial balance. So we'll go to cell G13, say equals, and then point to this 975. That will bring this zero up by 975 to 975. Put us out of balance by 975 and bring net income down by 975. So there we have that net income calculated as the 13 now minus the 780 minus the 795 giving us that credits winning net income not loss of 11 245. then we're going to post the cash side so here is cash here here is cash here something's in the cash account therefore we're going to double click on it go to the end of it say plus and then scroll back down and point to the cash. I'm going to scroll back up. We have to do a little scroll in there. So if you want to just type it in there, it would be equals C5 plus C8 plus D12 plus C14 plus D18. Once we do that, we should be back in balance. Then we're going to take a look and see what happens to the accounting equation. We know that the cash is going down. Therefore, the assets are going down. So I'm going to say uh, decrease in the asset. We know that the expense, well, nothing's happening to the uh, liabilities, neither of these accounts being a liability account. Therefore, liability, uh, none. And we know that the expense is increasing, which brought net income down. When net income goes down, it decreases total equity. So equity is going to be decreasing. So we have a decrease here. We also know that equity would then decrease if assets on this side go up and the other side must be equity and therefore if that's what's being affected it must then go down to remain in balance last transaction i'm going to change this this should be f so I'm going to put that there is going to be paid cash for supplies once again is cash affected first question qu answer yes keyword paid cash is going down uh, how do we make something go down? We do the opposite thing to it as its normal balance. Normal balance of cash is a debit represented without brackets here. To make it go down then, the opposite would be a credit. Gonna credit cash. Copy cash. Gonna put the credit on the bottom as is the normal convention. Here's the transaction place. We're gonna put it below F. Right click, paste, one, two, three. Amount, and I'm gonna go ahead and double click and indent one two three times the amount then in the credit section is going to be negative four five five and enter then we know that we're going to debit something for four five five and it's just a matter of what that debit then will be we paid for supplies so if we look at our chart of accounts we see supplies up here it's in the asset section you may be asking why it's not an expense and the reason is that it's gonna be our introduction to inventory, meaning under an accrual basis, we have not yet consumed the supplies in order to help us to generate revenue. And therefore, we're gonna put it on the books as an asset, as something we will consume in the future. When it is consumed and used, we will then take it out of the asset and record the expense, uh, record the consumption at the time of consumption. 
So we're going to say supplies. I'm going to copy that. And that's going to be the debit. Right click, paste, one, two, three. We already know that we're going to debit supplies due to the fact that we credited cash, but we also want to double check that to understand better the supplies account and double check our transaction. Therefore, we can look at supplies and say it's an asset like cash and therefore has a normal debit balance. We need to make it go up because we bought more supplies and the way to make something go up is to do the same thing to it as its normal balance supplies an asset having a normal debit balance the same thing being another debit so we just double check that we're debiting that for reasons other than just having to credit cash so now we're going to post this i'm going to post the supplies first so we are in the supplies account going to have to scroll up and down a bit we are in g7 so i'm going to say equals i'm going to scroll down a bit and point to this supplies here if you don't if you're having problems scrolling then you can just type in equals cell D or equals C20 and their supply increases 455 puts us out of balance by 455 cash then goes down by 455 so I'm going to scroll back up here's cash something's in it so I'm going to double click on it going to go all the way to the end we're going to say plus and then scroll back down and go to this 455 and enter so the cash account then this is everything that's in the cash account <laughs> equals c5 plus c8 plus d12 plus c14 plus d18 plus d21 and that's gonna be high you can also see that of course highlighting the cash accounts here so you could just point and click to all the cash accounts that puts us back in balance then we can see what happens in terms of the accounting equation. And this is a tricky one, the last one. We know that cash is going down and cash is an asset. So our typical response is to say, well, assets went down. And then we say, well, wait, what happened? What's the other thing that happened? Supplies also being an asset and it went up. So that means that really there's no effect on the supplies or the liabilities or the equity, although we had a transaction here that being one of the main reasons that the use of debits and credits is often better for actually building this stuff than using the accounting equation because it will provide a debit and a credit for each transaction rather than resulting like this does with um, with no effect on in in the accounting equation so the debits and credits are, are really what have to be used in terms of they don't have to be used but they're the best tool by far when compared to the accounting equation to actually constructing the trial balance. The trial balance then will be used to construct the financial statements. So now that we have the end product here, we can really just basically see, again, we don't need the financial statements if we have this ending trial balance formatted in this way to really understand a lot of what's going on. This simple little format without an income statement, balance sheet and equity really tells us pretty much all we need. And if we format it in this way with brackets, with credited numbers, we can, we can really get a lot of information just from this, this here. For example, if I want to know what total assets are, I can just highlight this in Excel, then Excel will add up total assets are 160,745. Total liabilities, obviously only one, but we can highlight those, 19,500. They have credit balances. That's typically not something that someone else would want to know, but the credit balances help us to calculate this number. If we want to know what the net income is, we already calculated it here. It's going to be the credit of 13,000 minus the debit of the expenses of 780 and 975, resulting in income, not a loss, credits beating the debits on the income statement of 11,745. If we want to know what the total uh, equity section is, we're just going to take the credit balance in the equity section, the investment, plus the revenue, minus the expense, minus the expense, meaning the credits are uh, over the debits. There are more credits than debits of four, uh, 141, 245. And that's going to be the total equity portion or kind of like the book value of the organization at this point in time, the business. That same number, remember that number, 141, 245 could also be calculated using the accounting equation of assets minus liabilities, meaning the green accounts 160 plus the 455 160 290 plus the 455 minus 
their liabilities of 19500 or the debits and assets minus the credits and, li and liabilities resulting in 141245 same number 141245 all the blue accounts have a credit of 141245 so note we can really get all the information we need from this format and if we use the brackets as as uh, credits then it really simplifies the calculations to get more of what we need in, in a really condensed format. That's the beauty of the trial balance. We're going to then put this trial balance into a more extended format at a later time. That format being the financial statements, an actual longer, kind of a more bulkier format, but one that we can then use to provide to other people, other people that don't understand debits and credits.